The next speaker was not born in the valley of the Genesee, but his, gra but his grandfather lived at Nunday, Livingston County, and his father was born and spent his boyhood there before attending Rochester University, from which he graduated. Both his father and his grandfather are buried in the little cemetery at Nunday, to which he makes frequent pilgrimages. Graduate of Williams College and student at Columbia and New York Law School. Recipient of honorary degrees from a number of colleges and universities. Counsel for Mark Twain, former member of the New York State Assembly, actively identified with the candidacy of Theodore Roosevelt for the presidential nomination in 1912, and one of the founders of the Progressive National Party, Secretary of State in the cabinet of President Wilson from March 22, 1920 to March 4, 4 1921, partner of Woodrow Wilson in the practice of law during the years 1921 to 1923 inclusive. Trustee of Colby College, author of The Close of Woodrow Wilson's Administration and the Final Years, one of the leaders of the Bar of the City of New York, and the most recently elected member of the Society of the Genesee, it is a pleasure to present the Honorable Bainbridge Colby. Mr. President, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I feel up here thanked by so many college presidents that I am in a position distinctly above my social station. You know the force of ancient association is very strong. And my feeling, as I see praxis to right of me and praxis to left of me, is that which I entertained many years ago when an undergraduate in a New England college. Contact with one president was awful enough. But to take him on in bunches like this, <laughs> Particularly as my associations with them always had some element of delinquency, either char charged or conscious. I remember one college president who discovered a classmate of mine to have a barrel of beer in his room. Of course, that was a flagrant violation of college propriety, if not college law, and he was put on the carpet very promptly and asked if it were true that he had a barrel of beer in his room, in his room. He said that he couldn't, said that he couldn't, said that he couldn't, said that he couldn't. And this uh, college president said, well, sir, you, well, sir, you must be aware that that constitutes, 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 very serious breach of discipline. And he said, yes, sir, I fear that it does. Well, said he, said he, how, how do you explain it? Well, sir, said he, I uh, did it on the advice of our family physician. Indeed, said uh, the president of my college with a somewhat icy, but icy air of incredulity. And then he said, uh, can you truthfully say that it has had uh, a beneficial effect upon your health?
Yes, yes, sir. The student replied quite brightly. I, I think I can quite truthfully affirm that it has. Because when I put that barrel of beer in my room, I could hardly move it. And now, after only two weeks, I can trundle it around with the utmost, with the utmost ease. <laughs> You know, educate, and I you. But a moment longer, my friend Dr. Fox touched upon the urbanity of New Yorkers. We who live here are not so constantly impressed with it, perhaps, as those who visit us. It recalls a famous remark of the late Joseph Schultz who referred to his friend Whitelaw Reeves as the Chesterfield of urbanity and the West Chesterfield of suburbanity. <laughs> and I, as a New Yorker who have often experienced and been obligated to the endurance and staying power of New Yorkers will not permit myself to unduly abuse it tonight. Education, however, my learned and distinguished friend, must be efficient. It must have relation to life. It must teach us the way. The cloistered education has its charm and its beauty and its consolation. But today, the country clamors for service, for protection, for guardianship by those who know what America means, who know the spirit of America, who, who love its spirit, and are not only enamored of its physical and material appeal. I remember a story of President Wilson that bears upon education. I was at that time in charge of the Department of State, and a young man who, with some very zealous friends was pressing upon me for appointment to some minor diplomatic post. He was all right. There was nothing very striking about his qualifications. But uh, he measured up, it seemed to me, and his friend said, won't you speak to the president about it? And I said, I'll be happy to. And one day, and one day I had that opportunity. I told him about this man's short but creditable career, and then I thought I would uh, pass the president a clincher. 